Okay, we're in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter um, 19 this morning. Actually, I probably want to do the end of chapter 18. I don't know if I want to or not. We'll decide. Chapter 19, let's all stand and we'll go through and, and read it. Actually, you know what? Let's start in chapter 18. Nah, 19. Verse 1. It says, And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it and uh, said that day, The king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away from, uh, when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face and the king cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house to the king and, to, and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, and that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore, arise, go out and speak comfort to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. Then the king arose and sat in the gate. And they told all the people saying, there is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, for everyone in, of Israel had fled to his tent. Now all the people were in a dispute throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, the king saved us from the hand of our enemies. He delivered us from the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? So King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, saying, speak to the elders of Judah, saying, why are you last to bring the king back to his house since the words of all Israel have come to the king to his very house? You are my brethren. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God, do so to me. And more also, if you are not commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah, just as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word to the king, return you and all your servants. Then the king returned and came to the Jordan and Judah came to Gilgal to go to, the, to meet the king, to escort the king across the Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gira, a Benjamite who was from Bahurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king. Then a ferry boat went across to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought was, uh, what, what he thought good. We'll stop right there and let's get into the text. Father, we just wanna uh, again come before you, Lord, and thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the blessing it is to know you and to hear from you, Lord. And as we're going through your word this morning, we pray that you'd show us wondrous things from your law and that you would just be speaking to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that although we were rebels, um, we were granted mercy by you and we came into a relationship with you that we don't deserve. And uh, Lord, we thank you again for the blessings that you've given us and pray that you bless us again this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Um, if you haven't been here, we've been going through a series uh, on the life of David. And this is um, basically the end of a battle that took place between David and his son, Absalom. I'm not going to go into a, a whole lengthy introduction here, um, but just suffice it to say that because of uh, some of the issues in David's life with his son, his son ends up rebelling against him, turning the people of Israel against him, basically uh, misrepresenting him in front of the people of Israel. And uh, he, he, uh, Absalom turns um, their hearts towards him and away from David, uh, his father. He then pronounces himself, or proclaims himself to be king in a place called Hebron, uh, which is where David was proclaimed to be king first. And uh, when that happens, and David finds out that 200 of, the elder, 200 of the elders of Israel had been there with Absalom in Hebron, 
he figures that um, he's not going to be able to keep the city of Jerusalem and keep the people of Israel on his side without a pitched battle. And so he takes off, goes down towards the Jordan River, and uh, he is um, helped by some of the kings in that area uh, for a short period of time. And then Absalom comes down with his armies to try to defeat David. Absalom is not a warrior. And uh, the guys that were with David had been guerrilla warriors for years, for, uh, for decades actually. And uh, they end up defeating Absalom and his forces in just a rout. They just tear the guy up. Absalom ang- ends up hanging from a terebinth tree uh, by his hair. And uh, Joab comes up and kills him uh, when he finds him. Uh, runs him through with a couple of spears and a number of uh, the men that were with him, 10 men, uh, come up and stab him to death. Absalom, again, is David's son. And at the end of uh, chapter 18, David had been given the information that Absalom was dead uh, by uh, one of the runners uh, that had come from, from Joab. Obviously, they didn't have radio, they didn't have telephones or cell phones at that time. And so if they wanted to get information, they had runners that would run back to a city or run back to a headquarters and tell um, what had taken place in the battle. Two runners came to meet David. The first one did not have all the information. And there's a reason for that uh, because Joab had killed the son of the king who David had asked that he be spared. Joab had killed him and it was actually a good move on Joab's part. Um, Life would have been uh, pretty messed up if uh, Absalom had continued after this whole thing. Um, But Joab wanted it, um, the information given to the king in a way that the king could receive it. There were two runners that asked to go. Actually, one runner was was consigned to go. Another runner asked to go. He didn't have all the information. He ended up getting there first. And in verse 28 of chapter 18, it says, So Ahimehaz called out and said to the king, All is well. Then he bowed down with his face to the earth and before, uh, before the king and said, Blessed be uh, the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimehaz answered, when Joab sent the king's servant uh, and me, your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what it was about. And the king said, turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. Just then the Cushite came, this is the other runner, and the Cushite said, there is good news, my lord, the king, for the Lord has avenged you this day of all those who rose against you. And the king said to the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? So the Cushite answered, may the the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise against you to do uh, harm be like that young man. And those are words most likely straight out of Joab's mouth. Joab's giving it to the king in the way that it needs to be received, the way that the king needs to hear it, despite the fact that obviously he loves his son. He goes goes on here, verse 33, then the king was deeply moved, went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And he, um, as he went, he said, thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And that's where we left it last time. David grieving over a son who was in absolute rebellion against him. A son who, if he had the chance, would have killed David himself. And yet David has a heart towards this guy, that um, um, overarched his um, fear of him in the sense of recognizing that Absalom was an absolute enemy. Um, One of the things that that I pointed out last time is that in all this, David is a type of Christ. Um, And it's something that I kind of referenced in in my prayer before the study. Um, We, the Bible says, were all in rebellion against God uh, before we became believers. And the Bible says that when Christ died for us, the love of God is manifested in this, that he didn't die for righteous men and women, obviously, but for the unrighteous. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly while we were yet sinners. Jesus didn't die for me when I was cheering for him. Jesus didn't die for me when I was on his side or considering him to be a great guy or anything like that. He died for me when I was in absolute rebellion. And one of, the, one of the things that you see with the Lord 
is the fact that there is judgment that comes down on people who are in rebellion against him. But God is never into the judgment. Sometimes he is the one who brings the judgment. Sometimes it's circumstances in people's lives that bring the judgment. God allows those things, but God is never into it. And you see that in, in numerous passages. There's a passage in the book of Ezekiel where God says, why will you die, Israel? Why won't you turn and live? And um, that's always God's heart. You see it again in the New Testament in 2 Peter, where he said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's always God's heart. And so um, you see this in um, obviously the, the life of David here. And I'm not minimizing the fact that David was actually a father, Absalom was actually a son, that whole thing, but he is a type of Christ in this. I think that sometimes when people think of the, the last judgment, that they think of God sitting up in heaven and he's enjoying it or something. And even all heaven is enjoying it or something. And it's just not true. God, God has moved heaven and earth literally to get people to recognize who he is and to recognize what he's done um, in trying to bring them into a relationship with him. And do you seriously think at the end that when he looks at people who have uh, ignored that or turned away from, from it or rebelled against it, that that kind of love that he exercised in trying to reach those people isn't going to be exhibited at the time of their judgment? And what's going to be happening is there are going to be people crying at the judgment. And I have no doubt that some of the people crying are going to be those who've made the wrong choices and turned their hearts away from God. But the most important one that's going to be crying is the Lord himself. And if you're one of those people that's going to be there in the last judgment, hearing the condemnation of God, you're not going to be hearing it in thunderous tones coming down upon you. You're going to be hearing it in a voice that's weeping and cracked, and at the end, he's going to be crying out for you as a son, as a daughter. Oh, my son, my son. And again, when you look at, at this passage, it's a great picture of the Lord's heart um, towards um, people who are in rebellion against him. You see that continued on in chapter 19. It says, and Joab was told, behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. Um, so the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people, for the people heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son and the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed um, steal away when they flee in battle. Now, like I said, it's a, it's a type, but it's an imperfect type. Um, when, when you see types in the Old Testament, they're kind of pictures of what's going to be taking place in the New Testament. They point forward to it. One of the clearest ones is... Uh, the, the type of Abraham offering up his son Isaac. You know, you know that one in Genesis chapter 22. People wonder why that happened. And it was a picture of what was going to be happening um, about 2,000 years later in, uh, outside the city of Jerusalem when another father offered up his only son at the very same spot that Abraham was told to offer up his son Isaac. In Abraham's uh, instance, the sacrifice um, didn't go through. In the Lord's instance, the sacrifice did go through. And obviously the father offered his son Jesus for the, the sins of us all. But when you see these types in the Old Testament, they're obviously um, pictured with flawed men. And sometimes the types are even wrecked. And uh, uh, in the case of Moses, remember that? The first time he strikes the rock, and the rock brings forth water. The rock is a type of Jesus. And out of Jesus comes the living water. The second time he's told to speak to the rock. And there's a reason for that. Jesus only had to be struck once to bring living water to his people. The second time Moses strikes the, strikes the rock again. And because of that, he's not allowed to go into the land of Israel, in the land of Canaan that he was coming from. And I'm sorry if I just lost you, but I'm just making the point that you have imperfect people that are being used for types of Christ in the Old Testament. You have the same situation with David. He is supposed to mourn for his son. That's what's supposed to be happening. But with David, um, as he's weeping over his son, it just consumes him. And he ends up um, being a failure in gratitude towards his people. These people had just gone out and fought a battle for him to secure what was rightfully his, 
and all David can think about is his child and he's not thinking, and again, a rebellious and undeserving child. That's all he can think about. And he's not thinking about these people who had offered up their lives literally for him. There's a failure in gratitude over there. And you, again, have this grief that, that, that's coming from David. And, you know, in, in some instances, um, obviously, you can, you can have grief in a situation that is, is, is toned with, a, with an understanding of every other situation that it's around it. Most times, you know, just having been a counselor for a while, when I see somebody that's overcome with grief in a situation, most often that doesn't just have to do with the fact that they love their kid or love that person. A lot of times it has to do with the failures in their own lives towards the person. All the regrets that start coming up in a situation like that. And if you've lost anybody, you, you, know, you know how that can be. There, there can be these regrets in a situation. Actually, I just um, found out um, probably about a month ago that my, um, the head football coach at my high school um, passed away. And I didn't know it until about, uh, probably about a week and a half, two weeks after he died. If I had known about it, I would have gone down for his funeral. And afterwards, I was just, I was really bummed out about the whole thing because he had been a major influence in my life. You know, about some of my, my background, and I'm not gonna go into that, uh, that whole thing again, but there were some guys that um, helped to keep me out of trouble. May, may, I was in trouble anyway, but major trouble, and he was one of the guys. Um, and he didn't do a whole lot, and I never asked a whole lot from, from anybody, but my coaches were some of the guys that were the most influential in my life, and he was one of, the, one of those men. I had never told him that, ever. And, um, you know, when I found out that he died, I, you know, all of a sudden I'm just like, you ungrateful twit. You never even told the guy. And so I ended up writing a letter to his widow, uh, Mrs. Dozier, and, um, you know, just, just telling her some of the things that uh, his name, uh, we called him Dub. Um, his name was William, but he went by Dub Dozier. Uh, just telling him some of the things that, uh, telling her some of the things that uh, he had done in my life and just, you know, some of the influences that he had made. Regret comes up and it causes you to grieve in ways that you might not be grieving if you had been doing the things that you were supposed to be doing with that person. So what, what's David regretting? Um, I think number one, he's regretting the fact that he was a lenient father. And that's one of the things that you see all the, all the way through the passages um, that, that deal with the mess in David's household. He had been told that there was gonna be a sword that um, entered his household and it was gonna, wasn't gonna go away. He was gonna pay for some of the sin that he had committed. And you can see uh, how God used some circumstances in the man's life to um, bring that sword about. And being a lenient father is one of them. You, know, you remember the whole issue between Tamar and, um, and her half-brother and the rape that went on and the fact that David got angry, didn't do anything about it. There's this whole mess that's going on in David's household. And part of the reason is because he wasn't willing to step in and stop it. And that probably wasn't the first time. Um, I've, no, I've noticed that with people too. When, when hard times come in a person's life and they have to make hard decisions, a lot of times all the, the, the way that they've handled themselves all the way up to that point ends up being exactly the same way that they will handle themselves in those issues that are big and need to be taken care of. If you are somebody who, who puts things off and does not handle situations, small situations, when they need to come up and you're constantly going, no big deal, no big deal, no big deal. When it does become a big deal, you've pretty much strapped yourself and you can't move at that point. And that's what happened with David. A son left to himself brings shame to his father, brings shame to his mother is what scripture says. And that's one of the things that you see with David with his family. Also, it looks like he's uninvolved. You don't see a whole lot of involvement in the, in the life of David with his sons. You don't see them, uh, actually you don't see them with David on any kind of level except for Absalom. And the only reason he was around Absalom and doing anything with the guy was because Joab kept, came up and kept pestering him about what needed to be happening in Absalom's life. And so that's the second thing. First thing is he's lenient. The second thing is he's uninvolved 
He's uninvolved. The Bible, when it speaks about the raising of children in Ephesians chapter six, it talks about the, the fact that the fathers need to be the fathers, not the mothers. The fathers need to be bringing their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And nurture has the idea of somebody who's, who's coming alongside and just being a comfort and watching over them and, and, and you know, kind of moving them in the right direction, that kind of thing. Admonition has the idea of there's correction there. There is discipline that needs to be taken place. And neither of those things, it looks like, was going on in David's life um, towards his children. And so that's the second thing that you see with this guy is he's an uninvolved father. And then, again, the other thing that you see with David's family is that he's indecisive. He's indecisive about what needs to be done. And we kind of covered that ground before. And again, there's reasons that he was indecisive. He'd, he'd basically uh, taken away any, any kind of uh, authority in being able to speak things into his children's lives because of the, of the sin in his own life. But at some point, you need to get over that, and move on and do what God says. The Bible talks about the fact that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. Not my self-respect and not my, you know, not my not peace in my household and not, you know, not that stuff. I need to be doing what Jesus wants me to do first. And Jesus made this whole thing clear as far as family relations and, and your relationship with him. It's supposed to be Jesus first, not my kids first. And I always keep that in mind when I'm dealing with my children. I love them, I, I care about them, I would die for them, you know, all of that is absolutely true. I, I love my kids, I love Jesus more. And if I don't love Jesus more than I love my kids, what ends up happening is I get this tweaked love towards my children where I'll end up in a David situation where they'll be doing things and I won't be restraining them and, you know, it's, it's something that's kind of a theme throughout First and Second Samuel. It happened with Eli and his sons. That was the high priest back in, in First Samuel chapter, uh, chapters 1 through 3. And then it happened in the life of Samuel. His sons were disobedient to the Lord. And Samuel, Samuel was the mentor of David. And then it happened in David's life. This kind of passed on thing where they just didn't deal with family issues in the way, in the way that they're supposed to be. That's, that, you know, that, those kind of chains are supposed to be broken when you become a believer. And so, um, you know, uh, I think, I think in, in many ways it was easier for me to break those kinds of chains in, in my life because I didn't really have them. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of focus on the kids and the family that I came from. It was more of a focus on what the parents wanted and that kind of thing. But if you came from a family where the kids were everything, you're gonna, you're gonna end up um, having a little, you know, having some conflict with the God of the universe because God doesn't put up with idols from anywhere. And so Jesus has to be first. And he said, if you love your father, your mother, your sisters, your brothers, you know, wife, husband more than me, you're not worthy of me. And so it's always Jesus first. And David should have known this. Actually, David did know this. It needed to be the Lord first and then after that is kids. And when that happens, then everything starts working out the way that it's supposed to. You love your kids the way that, they're, that you're supposed to. You will discipline them the way that you're supposed to. You know, if I, if I have this overwhelming love for my kids, what happens when my kids turn against me? Is it gonna flip around? And that's one of the things that I've seen with a lot of people. They have this overwhelming love for somebody and if it's not requited or you know, given back to them, then it, the love turns into hate. We saw that with Tamar and the brother who raped her. And uh, you, you can have this whole tweak thing going on. But if I love the, love the Lord more than I love anybody else and I love my kids in the way that the Lord's called me to, then it doesn't matter what they do. And if they turn away from me, I'm not gonna just walk away from them. Jesus didn't walk away from me. See what I mean? And I'm not gonna love them in a way that, that puts them in a, in a position where I don't care what they've done to other people. Jesus doesn't do that with me. He does care what I do with other people. And he'll discipline me if it's out of line. You see what I mean? And so every, everything, everything comes into, the situ, in, into this position where it's all just right. It's all right. 
And I, as a, as a father, am treating my children the way that I'm supposed to. And when they need to be restrained, I restrain them. When they need to be encouraged, I encourage them. When they need to be disciplined, I discipline. When they need to be loved, I love them. That, that whole thing. You just, you just do it like Jesus does it. And I think that that's part of the problem with David. He's sitting here looking at what's happened with his son, and he can see his handprints all over it. And he's probably grieving for that as much as he's grieving for the death of his son. And in doing that, what ends up happening is, again, he is weeping over his son, but he's got a failure in gratitude towards the people who are around him. Now, again, with the type of, of David or with the type of Jesus, none of this is happening in heaven. You're not gonna have a situation where you come before the Lord and all he can do is grieve over the fact that he's lost most of the people on the planet. You do realize that's what's gonna happen. Jesus said that. He said, narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there are that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are that go that way. Jesus said it. So most of the planet is gonna to go to the pit. And when we stand before God, when we get to heaven, there's still going to be rejoicing over the ones who served him faithfully and um, you know, we're just basically on his side. There's still gonna be that rejoicing. So at the same time that there's tears over those who have been lost, there's gonna be rejoicing over those who have been saved. And not only saved, but again, served faithfully. There's a passage in 2 Peter verses, uh, uh, chapter one, verses 10 through 11 that says, therefore brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is an abundant entrance that's going to be supplied for you when you come into the kingdom. It's going to be this joyous celebration is the idea behind that for every single one of you. You know, I, you know when I think of going to heaven, a lot of times, I, you know, you get this picture of St. Peter's at the gate and you come up, you're standing in line, kind of knocking on the door. He's looking at a book to see if you're even allowed in. It's like, who are you? Let me check you out and, and that kind of thing. And that's not what the Bible says is going to be happening. What Jesus said, and I, I, I use this all the time, what Jesus said is going to be happening to you is that when you come home to be with him, he's going to be saying these words to you. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. And so it's not Peter that's gonna be meeting you, it's Jesus that's going to be meeting you. And he's not gonna be meeting you looking in a book. Let me see if I know you or not because he knew you right before that. In fact, um, many of us, when we end up going home to be with the Lord, it's probably gonna be in a situation where we know we're going home. You know, uh, most of us in America end up dying in bed someplace and usually of an illness. And so you know what's gonna be happening. And I've visited a lot of people who are in that situation. They're doing a lot of praying. And so you can imagine that when, you're, when your life gets wrapped up, unless you get creamed in a you know, car accident or something. Any of you who have motorcycles, this is not going to happen to you. You're probably gonna be on the pavement somewhere. You know. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I would have a motorcycle too if my wife would let me. <laughs> but um, what am I talking? I just lost it totally. Seriously, I lost it. Oh, abundant entrance. You know, uh, <laughs> you know you're, you're most likely gonna be praying right before you, before you end up going home to be with the Lord. That's most likely what's gonna be happening to you. And do you really seriously think that you're gonna be talking to the Lord? He's hearing you. He's speaking back to you. And then you open your eyes up in heaven and he's like, who, who, who are you? It doesn't work that way. He already knows you. He knows who you are. And so when the entrance comes in, it's gonna be an awesome thing. It's not gonna be this thing where you slink off to your, you know, your mansion someplace and you know, Jesus is mourning over those he didn't get. He's gonna be, be rejoicing over the ones that he got, an abundant entrance. You see Joab's uh, political savvy here too. 
In verse five, it says, then Joab came into the house of the king and said, today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, lives of your wives, the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you've declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore arise, go out and speak comfort to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. And the king arises, sits in the gate. The people are told that David's uh, sitting in the gate. And so all the people came before the king for every one of Israel had fled to his tent. There are times when people need to be rebuked for just their self-centeredness. And again, Joab is one of those guys in, in the Bible that it's, it's like he's a mixed bag because sometimes he's just right on and sometimes he's tweaked. And you know, at the, actually um, uh, in, the, in the very next chapter, he, he just goes up and knifes another guy. And so this guy's all over the page, but this is good advice. He walks in, into David's, morning chamber and just rebukes the guy and tells him act like a king you have all these servants who've gone out and they've done these things for you and you need to be grateful to them and you're not and they they think that they've done something wrong which they hadn't um, and you have this uh, again uh, political um, knowledge uh, uh, just wisdom uh, not only with David, but with Absalom, the whole situation with Absalom, a Absalom needed to be taken out. Actually, you see it all the way through Absalom's life because he, what, what, uh, what Joab sees from David is nothing but um, chaos in his relationship with Absalom. And, and Joab intervenes a number of times with David to try to get him to do the right thing with the kid. And um, admittedly, Joab doesn't go into a long counseling session and tell him exactly how it needs to be done. He just intervenes at certain points and says, this is what needs to be happening here. You're sending him off. You're doing all this stuff. You're sitting around mourning for the fact that your son's not here. Just call him back. Just go and make it right. And, you know, I can't see that Joab's a believer. I don't think he is. And yet he's got all kinds of wisdom on how to treat Absalom. And if David had been listening up to what Joab was saying, probably none of this would have happened. None of it would have happened. And, but David just did half measures all the way through the thing. Now, again, Joab ends up being a guy that, that you know, he, he just gets dealt with. He goes, he goes on both sides of the whole thing, but he's right in this situation. He's right with Absalom. He was right when he put Absalom to death in the battle. Um, he's right with the people. He knows, he knows exactly what the people need to hear from David at this point. And he's right with David too. He knows, he knows how to come up and talk to the man and get him to turn around on things. Now David um, ends up uh, probably because of other political issues and you know, things that have gone on in the, in the past with Joab, ends up trying to get rid of Joab over and over again. And um, that's really part of the reason for Joab going after these guys. In fact, Amasa in the next chapter gets killed by him because David replaces Joab with Amasa. And so again, you have this whole, you know, kind of tweaked political thing going on in the midst of this whole thing. But um, Joab gave him some right counsel in this situation. And so David gets up and goes out and does what he's supposed to be doing. There are times when we're going through life and things can be overwhelming and you just want to sit in your room and lay on your bed and do nothing else. Um, I, I am still called to be a pastor. I'm still called to be a husband. I'm still called to be a father. I'm still called to be a friend, a friend to the people who are around me. I have responsibilities. And the fact that I'm feeling bad doesn't negate the fact that I have responsibilities. And it's the same thing with you. You have responsibilities. God's put you on the planet for a certain reason and for a certain time, such a time as this, the Bible teaches. And you need to be doing the things that God has called you to, even if they're not comfortable at the, at the time. And, you know, God bless faithful men and women who will come up and point that out to you when you, when you feel like bailing on those things. You have uh, rebellion uh, uh, among the people. 
um, or actually uh, you have a group of rebellious people that David's got to get things straight with. In verse nine, it says, now all the people were in a dispute throughout all the tribes of Israel saying the king saved us from the hand of our enemies. He delivered us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he's fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, whom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? So David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priests saying, speak to the elders of Judah saying, why are you the last to bring the king back to his house since the words of all Israel have come to the king to his very house? You're my brethren, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, um, are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also, if you are not commander of the army before me continually, in the place of Joab. And you can see the fact that even, although David did what Joab wanted, he didn't really appreciate the man. So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah, just as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word to the king, return you and all your servants. And so then the king returns. This is what's going on there. Um, basically, the northern 10 tribes were complicit in the whole Absalom thing because they had been coming from the furthest away and Absalom went after those northern 10 tribes to try to turn their hearts towards him. Well, they did. And after the fact, after the battle was done and Absalom was dead, they realized that they'd been ungrateful to the king of Israel, David. They'd been ungrateful to him and that they were in a precarious position because the guy that they had supported had died and um, it was obvious that they were ungrateful to David. And so when the people recognized this whole political situation, they went to their elders and said, why have you not sent to bring back David? This is our position. David delivered us from the Philistines. He did all this stuff for us. And we supported his enemies. And here he is victorious and you're not calling him back. And they get on the elders of Israel to get them to do that. And so that was a popular movement that took place. When David heard of that, he sent these two representatives. So King David, verse 11, uh, sent to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, and said, speak to the elders of Judah. So he sends these two guys to go talk to the elders of, of Judah, which is a different group. The elders of Israel are the 10 northern tribes. The elder, elders of Judah are the southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah. And so he sends to these guys and say, How, you know, all these other guys are talking about bringing me back and you're saying nothing. And why haven't you called for me to come back? You know, one of the, one of the things that you, you see with the Lord is that he'll wait. And what David did here was he waited down on the other side of the Jordan even after he'd conquered the armies of Absalom. He waited there. And he waited to hear word from his people to see if they wanted him back. And the first group of people that wanted him back were the 10 Northern tribes. And so he heard word from there and he waited for that. And then he's waiting for word from the tribe of Judah and he's hearing nothing. So he sends two witnesses to them, two people to represent him. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, when you get to the New Testament, the book of Revelation, the Bible talks about the fact that Jesus has been waiting for his people to return to him and that there's going to be a long period of time from the, from the uh, ascension of Jesus into heaven to the second coming in which the people of Israel are going to be turned against him and that um, in the tribulation period that their hearts are going to be changed and they're going to recognize that he's the Messiah. And specifically to the tribe of Judah. And the reason I'm saying this is because the two witnesses go to Jerusalem, which is in the area of Judah. Specifically to the people of Judah, which is the major tribe that's left anyway, God sends two witnesses in the book of Revelation to get them to realize that he's the Messiah. And uh, you have that whole thing. And so that's what's happening here. And so Jesus waits. You know, um, one, of the, one of the things that you see with the Lord, and this is, a, a, again, is a, is a great type of, of Jesus, is the fact that he doesn't push himself on people. He doesn't push himself on people. And so again, what you have here with David is, he's a rightful king, 
fought a battle, won it. Um, he was pushed out um, in a way that wasn't, wasn't right in the first place. He had, a, every, he had every right to the throne of Israel. And he doesn't push himself on these people. He just waits on the other side of the Jordan till he hears word. And it's the same thing um, for the Lord with us. Um, you know, what Jesus will do is, well, you know, the Bible talks about the fact that if we will call on the name of the Lord, then we'll be saved. You know what God does? He waits for the call. It's what he does. Makes himself known different ways, but he's still waiting for the call. And the reason that he does that is because the Bible says he's humble. Jesus said, I'm humble, I'm lowly in heart, and I wanna give you rest for your souls. And God doesn't come and push himself on anybody. Again, you know, one of the things that he'll do is that he'll make himself known, but he's way more gentle about that than I ever would be. You know, it's like, I, I don't know. I, I, with, with some people, actually I'm with that, like that with some people. Some people who go on and on about, you know, whether or not they're going to follow the Lord or whether or not they're going to serve the Lord. I get, I get frustrated with them. I'm like, decide, get, you know, get your act together. Stop bothering me. If you don't want to follow Jesus, get out of here. And if you do want to follow Jesus, then just do it. Come on, you wimp. How'd you like me to be God? <laughs> and I've gotten more mellow over the years and stuff and, and, uh, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Got, gotten a little bit more like Jesus, but that's how the Lord is. He'll wait for you and he'll keep putting up with you. Actually, that's, the, that's really the, the whole thing with God's humble. The, uh, the Lord Jesus is humble is the answer to the question, why doesn't God make me? A lot of people would like God to make them become Christians. He would like, they would like God to make them do the things that he wants them to do. It's almost like, I, you know, I just, I, just, I just give it up and God just makes me or something. And God just doesn't do that. You know, God, God wants you to come to him and he wants you to come to him, uh, you know, because you have a heart that loves him. And he wants you to do the things that he calls you to do, but he's not interested in making you a robot in all that stuff. What he wants you to do for him is the stuff that you do because you love him. And if you're, if you're doing it for any other reason, then it ends up being this tweak thing and he's just not interested. And again, uh, when, when you're looking at, at God and you, you, you always have to keep it relational. It's not, you know, a contract. There is a contractual portion to the gospel and salvation and, and that kind of stuff, but that's not how God sees it. He doesn't see it as a contract any more than most of you see your marriage as a contract. I want my wife to want to be around me because she loves me, not because she's contractually obligated, right? I want her to do things for me because she loves me, not, just, not because I've demanded it. You know, there's, it's, it's always better when somebody does things for you just because they want to. And that's what God's looking for in the relationship that he's got with us. And obviously, ladies, you know the same thing with your husbands. You want your husbands to be hanging around with you because they have to. And if you have a marriage that's like, the, that's like that, it's a pitiful thing. And it's, and it's something that, you know, it's just not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be more than that. And that's what God wants with us. And again, that's the answer, the, the whole issue with God being humble is the answer to why God doesn't make you. He's never going to make you. He's never going to do it. He's never gonna make you come to him. He's never gonna make you do the things he calls you to. He's never going to make you. He's never gonna make anybody else either. You know, a lot of times when we're praying for, for people to get saved or whatever, we're asking God to save them. And what we mean is make them get saved. God, you know what's best for them. I know what's best for them. Just get her done. Make them get saved. And God is never going to do that. It's never going to happen. And so, you know, he understands what your prayer is about and he understands your desire for them. He's got a greater one than you do. He understands all that. And so I think that a lot of times when people are praying, God, will you just please just make them get saved or please just save them in, in that kind of sense. He does what he's doing. 
And what he's doing is he's revealing himself to them, revealing what their sin is, revealing what their future is, showing them all this stuff, opening their eyes to the truth of the gospel, doing all of that stuff, letting them see clearly what's happening. And then they get to make a choice. They don't have to follow him. They don't have to have him as king. They don't have to. And if they don't want him, um, he doesn't want to be. But if they do, he does. And again, that's, that's what you see here. Now, with the two witnesses, you, know, so, you, know, you say, Steve, well, yeah, but he sent two, two guys to go and talk to these guys. You know, the Lord's not above knocking. You know, the, the Bible talks about God knocking on the door of your heart. Jesus said, behold, I'm, you know, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and King Jimmy says, sup with him and he with me. You know, that whole thing with eating with somebody. It represented closeness, tightness. We just had Thanksgiving. Hopefully your Thanksgiving was a good one. And it's always good when you got family and friends around and, and uh, you have awesome fellowship going on and, and that kind of thing. You're one. That's, that's, that's when families become one. It's a, it's a very cool thing. And that's the same kind of picture that God has in uh, Revelation 3.20, where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. He wants to have fellowship with you. But he's standing at the door and knocking. He doesn't say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I'm going to knock about five times, and I'm going to bust the door down, come in, and we're having Thanksgiving. Okay? <laughs> it's not going to happen that way. And although the Lord's not above knocking, he will... Um, continue to knock and if the door doesn't open, the door doesn't open, the handle's on your side as far as he's concerned and it's not on his. And so you get to, again, make those choices. You have the return of the king. Comes across on a ferry boat in, in uh, verse 18, then a ferry boat went across to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And that's interesting. Um, we just went to Israel and um, actually uh, went to the Jordan River and uh, did some baptisms in the Jordan River. The Jordan River is not now what it used to be. Um, they've, been, they've been taking water out of the Sea of Galilee for quite a while. They take water out of, the, out of the Jordan River to do irrigation and stuff like that. So whenever I take people over to Israel and show them the mighty Jordan River, <laughs> it's like a creek, basically. It's not a creek. It's a little more than a creek. But, you know, it's, it, it's like there's, there's not much to it. Um, up at the northern end of the Jordan River where it comes out of the Sea of Galilee. There's not much to it. It's like a, you know, I don't know. It's a good size, good, good small river, a uh, small river. It's like the, the, the bank is probably from here to about halfway across the sanctuary. That's, uh, that's how, how wide the thing is, and it's not very deep. And when you get down to the southern end of the Jordan where it goes in, and this is, this is where David's at, where it goes into the, uh, into the Dead Sea, it's nothing but a trickle down there because they've taken all the water out for irrigation. So you read about the, uh, the Jordan being in flood stage and they cross over on dry land. Well, you can do that right now, you know, because there's, again, not, not much to it. There was more to it, obviously, at this point. You needed a ferry boat to get across the, the thing. And so the king comes home. You have the return of the king. It says, now Shimei, son of Gira, fell down before the king. Remember, he came with a thousand men from Benjamin. Remember who Shimei was? Shimei is a guy who's up on the, uh, up on the hill, throwing rocks at David, saying, ca calling him, him a bloody man and telling David that the reason that he'd been deposed is because God was against him. And one of David's men says, let me just go up and take his head off. You always want guys like that around you. Somebody will take somebody's head off for you. It's, it, those are good friends to have. <laughs> and David says, no, don't do it. It may be, it, you know, this may be the will of God in this situation. Well, Shimei expects that David's going to be taken out and it doesn't happen the way that Shimei thinks it, it, it was supposed to happen. And so now David's coming back and Shimei's in a little precarious position. He's come out with what, it, what his heart really thinks. And now he's got to come back to David and kiss up to the guy. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, if Shimei had a spine, he would have left. Um, now Shimei, the son of Gira, fell down before the king when he had crossed the Jordan. Then he said to the king, do not let my Lord impute iniquity to me. 
Or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my Lord the King left Jerusalem, that the King should take it to heart. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned. Therefore, here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord the King. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, that's the guy who wanted to take his head off, answered and said, shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? So he's been thinking about it for a while. And he's like, you know, the first, when he first saw the guy, let me take his head off. And the next time he sees him, he's like, let me take his head off. Nothing's really changed, David. We can, you know, just take care of this guy right now. And David said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should be um, adversaries to me today? Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? For do I not know that today I am king over Israel? Therefore, the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king swore to him. And so obviously David is giving out mercy instead of justice on this man, which is, you know, that's, you know, the merciful get mercy. The just get justice. And so it's a matter of what you want to get. And David is merciful to this man. Later on, the guy gets justice. Later on, he does. The next book. But in this instance, David extends mercy to him. And can you, can, you, can you see that with David? One of the things that you always notice about David is when things were personal against him, it wasn't a huge deal. When it was personal against him, it wasn't a huge deal. You start doing things to other people, and it's a big deal. And um, you see that with Abishai. Abishai wasn't personally offended by Shimei. He's offended because David was personally offended. Um, you know, Abishai's not coming up to David going, ah, David, you know, just let it go, buddy. Abishai's coming up to David going, let me kill him. And David's like, no, just let it go, buddy. And, you know, I, I, I kind of think that's the way that it's supposed to be. That's the way that things are supposed to go. And when you are personally attacked, what Jesus said was, you turn another cheek. So if they hit you on the right cheek, you turn their, you're left to them, is what he said. And this is what David's doing in this situation. He's got absolute power over this guy. Could do anything he wants to him. But what David is, is meek. And again, that's a, that's a, that's a type of Christ. He's meek in the situation. He's willing to take the um, insult, even though he's got power to do something about it. And that again is what we're supposed to be as believers, not weak. David's not weak in the situation. He could do what he wants to the guy, but he is meek. And that we, that's what you see with the Lord too. Then you have Mephibosheth, verse 24. It says, now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king and he had not cared for his feet nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. When he says he hadn't cared for his feet, what it's talking about is he hadn't washed his feet. It was a custom in Israel that when you came into a house, you washed your feet. Obviously, you're wearing sandals, you're out in the dirt and, and that kind of thing. You come in, you wash your feet. And obviously, he hadn't done it, and it was obvious because his feet were filthy. Probably smelled too. He hadn't trimmed his mustache, which, you know, all men do that. Trimming mustaches. Uh, washed his clothes from the day the king departed and uh, uh, until the day he returned in peace. So it was when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, my lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king because your servant is lame. And he has slandered your servant to my Lord, the king. But my Lord, the king is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were but dead men before my Lord, the king. Yet you set your servant among those who eat at your own table. Therefore, what right have I still to cry out any more to the king? So the king said to him, why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said, you and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, rather let him take it all inasmuch as my Lord, the king, has come back in peace to his own house. So you remember Ziba came out and David had, uh, when David was leaving and David had said, where's Mephibosheth? And Ziba said, Mephibosheth has designs on the, on the throne. He th thinks that now that you're gone, that he, the, the throne is gonna revert to the, Saul of, or to the house of Saul. He was the last from the line of the house of Saul. So he thought he was gonna be king is what Ziba said. 
Kings in those days were not lame men. If you, you were a warrior king. And so on the face of it, that can't be the truth uh, in the situation. And you find out when, when David comes back that Mephibosheth has been mourning the, to- the whole time that David was gone. And basically Ziba took advantage of the situation, knew that Mephibosheth couldn't get around after all the servants had left. Ziba and his sons were his servants. So couldn't get around once the servants had left, no way to get to David. And so um, he conspired to get all of Mephibosheth's lands. What David had said to him uh, at the very beginning, Ziba had been the master of Mephibosheth's lands before David had dealt with Mephibosheth. And what David had said to them was that Ziba was going to work the land and he was going to be able to take his part from the land and the rest was going to go to Mephibosheth. So the land had already been divided by David before any of this had ever taken place. And so when David comes, comes back, he sees that Mephibosheth is there, he straightens things out with them, and it looks like what he does is he just goes back to the original deal. Because when Ziba had come out, he'd given all the land to Ziba, and now it looks like they are in the, in the same original deal. In any case, um, he doesn't, uh, again, um, go after Ziba. And some people think that it's because he may not have known exactly what the situation was, and so he wasn't going to come down on that whole thing. Or it may just be that David didn't want to execute judgment on the day that he's returning to Jerusalem. And so he straightens things out with Mephibosheth. And then finally, Barzillai, verse 31. It says, And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogelim, and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now, Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. And he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzillai, come across with me and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, how long have I to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? In other words, I'm about to die. I'm old, Okay. I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between the good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to my Lord the King? And what he's saying here is when he says, can I discern between the good and bad? It's probably talking about his sight. I can't discern between what looks bad and what looks good anymore. And um, when he says, can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? What he's talking about is his hearing. Obviously, your sight starts going, your hearing starts going. And then he's, he, um, oh, also he says, can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? And these are all things that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> and apparently, as you get older, I know, I know about the not being able to see thing. And I knew about the not being able to hear thing. I didn't know about the not being able to taste thing. And so apparently as you get older, your taste buds get worn out and stuff. I think that happens anyway. Remember when you were a kid and you, you, know, you had to eat broccoli and how nasty it was? And then you grow up and you know, people say that your taste starts changing and you start liking things that you didn't like. No, that's not what's happening. You just can't taste it anymore. That's what's happening. It's in the Bible. It's right there. <laughs> And at some, at some point, you're going to be able to put any old nasty thing in your mouth and you're going to like it. <laughs> and obviously, he's saying you're old. I, you know, I kind of like the old thing. I, I, like, I like the whole, you know, there's some, some aspects of getting older that I don't like. You know, it's like you get up in the morning, your legs are all creaky and, you know, I've got stairs and I'm walking down the stairs and my knees are aching and now my ankles are aching and all this stuff. And I still love football. I don't care. Every time I talk about that, they go, was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it. Every stinking hit, every sprained ankle, every, every creamed knee was totally worth it. Anyway, <laughs> in, any, in any case, you know, it's, it's like you, you get older and you start feeling certain ways and, and that kind of stuff. And, and actually, my vision just started to go. I have some glasses right here. I keep them on hand just in case. I can still read, but... Um, my vision just started to go and that's kind of a bummer, bummer, but you know, the whole thing is like, it's like, I don't know, it's kind of cool because you're getting towards the end of stuff. I'm starting to get excited. You know, if the Lord doesn't come back, it's like, you know, it all just, everything just starts shutting down, closing up, 
It's like closing up shop. Let's get out of here, man. It's time to go home. <laughs> the day's almost over. It's Friday. <laughs> For all you guys that are 80, I may be, I may be on Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Some of you are on Monday. He <laughs> goes on, verse 36. Um, he says, your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with a king, and why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and mother, but here is your servant, Chimham. Let him uh, cross over with my lord, the king, and do for him what seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall cross over with me and I'll do for him what seems good to you. Now, whatever you request of me, I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan and when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him and he returned to his own place. And what you have there is an example of giving, expecting nothing in return. The guy had obviously given to thousands of people in that situation. There was a, there was a huge group of people that was with David and Barzillai was the one who had helped to take care of him. And when it comes time to um, reap the rewards, Barzillai's just not really interested. He's like, I don't need it. I didn't, I didn't give it to you to get something back. I just gave it to you to give. And that's a, that's a good example. You, know, you get to the New Testament and Jesus talks about giving and he says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he's kind to the unthankful and the evil. And it's in the same passage, Jesus said this, give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And that's the, you know, that's the attitude that we're supposed to have in giving to the Lord. When we give of our lives, when we give of our time, when we give of our uh, finances, when we give of anything that we give to the Lord, it's supposed to be given just to give and not expect anything back in return. You're not paying for anything here. You don't pay for anything. And with our walks with God, if it, if it happens any other way, it just ends up being a tweaked situation. There's all kinds of churches who think that they're paying God off. If I pay God 10%, then he's gonna give me back, uh, you know, a hundredfold. And you start doing the math and going, I'm gonna get rich, this is a great deal. And, you know, lots of, lots of people are motivated by that whole thing. And God's up in heaven looking at that and going, oh, well done. Come on. You know, can, can you imagine doing that to your dad? Can you imagine doing that to your mom? Can you imagine doing that to one of your friends? And you're gonna do that to God? Come on. That's not, that's not what we do here. What we do is we just serve the Lord and we, and we love him. And the Bible talks about actually, you know, Jesus is making the point there that your giving is not something that he's not going to see or that he's not going to care about it. There are, there are rewards for those things. But the, but the purpose of giving isn't to get a reward. The purpose of giving is out of gratitude for the things that God's already given. And so when you look at you know, what, the, what the scripture says about any kind of giving, as far as whether, you, whether you're giving of your time, or, you know, things to people, lending like he says in this passage, or doing anything like that, it's just because of the, the work that God's done already in your heart and done already in your life. And you know, it's like you just, oh, you know, when, I, when I think of tithing and stuff, I'm not, I, I don't know, I'm not paying God off. I'm just thanking God for everything that he's given to me. That's, and that's how it's supposed to be. When I serve him, I'm not paying God off. I'm just giving back to him because of all the things that he's given to me, he's served me. When I'm serving others, I'm not paying God off in that. Well, sometimes, God, this one's for you. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But, you know, I'm not paying God off in those things. I'm, I'm doing it because he, he loves me and he's done things for me. And that's always supposed to be the attitude behind these things. And then, you know, obviously he comes back. We're gonna quit right there. But, you know, all kinds of really cool stuff in, in that passage about what Jesus is to us and what we're supposed to be to him. I love the, the fact, you know, I love that whole picture of, uh, of David's heart towards a rebellious son 
and David's heart towards a rebellious people. He loves them and uh, he, he wants them. He's, uh, um, he's not somebody who's gonna force himself on anybody. And again, I, I love that about the Lord. He's not you know, some harsh taskmaster. So let's pray and I'll get you out of here. Father, I just thank you again, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you, um, God, so much for so many passages in scripture. And just kind of even incidental historical passages that, that just point to the nature and the heart that you have towards us. God, I thank you that you're a God who doesn't force himself on us. I thank you that you're a God who will wait for us and, and uh, who will listen for the call. Um, I thank you that you're also a God who, who doesn't just leave it status quo. If we need a nudging, you give us a nudging, but you still wait. And uh, Lord, just, just thank you that you waited for me. Thank you that you waited for these people too. Lord, we pray that um, as we're entering into the Christmas season here, um, Lord, I, I mentioned earlier that you moved heaven and earth uh, to get everybody on this planet. And just, it's just a fact that not everybody's gonna come. But you did move heaven and earth to do it. And as we enter into a, a, a time uh, in our calendar that, that speaks to that whole fact, Lord, we just, we just pray that you give us that same heart towards the friends and family that we have around us. That, um, Lord, we know that you wanna reach out to them, that you want them to come, that you care about them, that you're grieving and mourning over them when they don't. Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to be like that. Um, just help us to see our family and our friends, even our enemies, Lord, in the way that you do. And um, just make us more like you. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.